and good afternoon. Hello, good uh, good day to you. My name is Tina Brock. I'm the uh, artistic director at the Idiopathic the Idiopathic Radiculopathy Consortium here in Philadelphia, and also your host for Into the Absurd. And we welcome you on this lovely sunny Saturday afternoon where we're celebrating all things fringe, all things music and artistic related. And we're going to be delving more into that with Mark Fitzgerald Wilson, who is the executive director of the Zollner Art Center at Lehigh University. And just to give you a couple of uh, up, up things to keep on your calendar, upcoming events for the IRC. We're gonna be here the next couple of weeks with Into the Absurd Saturdays at 5 p.m. We're gonna be working on, we are working on a program for the holidays, which is an adaptation of August Strindberg's The Stronger, which David Robson, playwright David Robson has adapted. And his lovely wife, Sonia Robson and myself will be working on that. And we'll be live streaming that around the holidays. So that is coming up and we plan our return to the stage in 2022 with uh, some Tennessee Williams for you. And we'll be talking to you more about that as the date is secured for that. So we will be back and can't wait to be with you on the stage with you in the audience. But until then, you've got into the absurd and you have uh, the stronger in the fall. So we'll be around and we'll be coming to you with special events on into the absurd and highlighting the works that are happening in Philadelphia and around the country. On today's show, Mark Wilson. Mark, uh, as we mentioned, the Executive Director at Lehigh University of Zollner Arts Center. And we're gonna talk to Mark about his very fascinating trajectory through opera and loss prevention and as a music professor and the plans that he has for the Zollner Arts Center in the years to come. So we invite you to put your questions in the chat and we'll Join in the conversation with Mark and let's get Mark to the ITA dinner table right now and begin this conversation. Mark Wilson, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I so enjoyed reading about your interesting trajectory, both geographically around the country, through the arts, through music, through opera, through loss prevention. And I guess I'd love to start with um, your your time in school uh, at Simpson College, is that correct? Uh, That's where correct. You studied. Yeah. When you were in school, what was your dream? Did you, did you have a specific place you saw yourself or was music the first step along this journey? Yeah, uh, uh, you know, going to um, Simpson, um, you know, in Iowa, it was uh, it was quite a, um, a journey for me from there. It wasn't that far from where I lived um, from high school. It was basically like 10 miles away. And I knew the folks from the school for some time. When I was a freshman in high school, I went to a summer camp at Simpson called the Orpheus Festival. And from there, it was like um, the folks were kind of recruiting me to their school. Um, and when I was trying to make that decision of what I wanted to do, I was looking at a couple of schools, whether I wanted to do music, I was looking at uh, University of Cincinnati and Simpson College. And then I was looking at um, Howard University because I was thinking about uh, going into politics. And I remember the uh, chair of the music department said, uh, you're smart enough that if you ever wanted to go back into politics or going to law school, you can always do that. But if you wanna you know, start this craft and the arts, you should start doing that now so you can really um, hone your skills. So um, I'm a pragmatist. So when I went to school, I decided to major as a music educator um, and not into performance because I, I figured I wanted to give myself multiple options of what to do. Um, and part of what I, I never knew I wanted, to, you know, where I was going to go from there. But you know, wanting to perform was one of the things I was looking at doing when I first started at at um, college as a freshman. Were you exposed to a lot of music? When you were growing up as a kid in your family, did you have music as a part of your diet? Yeah, I, I was the only person in my family that sung. Um, and so there were pictures of me as a young child singing um, Michael Jackson songs. Um, and it was, uh, I would say, a lot of the Motown stuff is the things that I grew up with, things that I, I love doing. I love singing some uh, Minnie Ripperton and Diana Ross also. Um, I had a high voice for a long time. 
Um, but it was around fourth grade that I stopped singing because my voice changed that summer. Um, and so because I was still in elementary school, my voice started changing early. Um, I wasn't allowed to sing anymore because they were like, well, your voice is too low. Oh, no. Is that what happens to kids when, I mean, is that a, I guess I'm showing my ignorance by asking this question, but I mean, does that happen? That I well, guess it I does, right? I have yeah, to do. Yeah, because usually it's like all, all trouble voices. So it's very simple and easy, or you have two part troubles and um, my voice changed and I, I don't think the teacher knew what to do. So it's like, just mouth this. <laughs> so I just <laughs> mouth. <laughs> so then, I, then I was like, okay, I guess I can't sing anymore. So that was done. It wasn't until I went to middle school that I started singing again. Oh. Oh no! Were you sad? Yeah, I was. I mean, it was it was something that was was important for me. You know that yeah. that singing. Yeah. Oh my gosh! I I oh that's that's so sad. I'm glad you got back to it. And it was how how was the sort of performing aspect of it then when you got to to school? I mean, I, I'm assuming you were performing along the way in high school, and then you got to college. But what is it about performing for you that that or, or was it performing that that was exciting to you? Or was it more just to sing and performing as a part of that? Yeah, it's, I think um, it's the vibrations that I felt when, I'm, when I was singing and it like reverberated throughout my body and it was great to feel. And whenever you have um, something going wrong, you just go out and sing and, and belt some notes was, was great. Um, it was a challenge when I, was in, when I was in college, as I tell people, I was a music major when I came to college and I didn't even know how to play the piano because I didn't take piano lessons at all. And so in order to graduate from my school, you had to take piano lessons. Um, and my teachers that I have were great. And um, obviously I did graduate, which means that I did learn um, how to play the piano. Um, but that, you know, the, 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 the singing was really, was really important. Um, but I was also one that had those those challenges, and I think you know, for I think a lot of us gone through those things. We figure whether or not we're going to go back or not. And I remember there was um, some books I got sort of like new music, and I couldn't learn the songs, and I would just rip up the book and throw it in the trash can. I would leave, and I remember it was so expensive. My freshman year, I went through so many books as I when I learned new music. I was like, ah, I can't learn the song. I get mad and like ah, and throw it in the garbage. I'm like I'm done. Um, but I did. Um, you know, triumph over that. And, and I, I, you know, I tell folks, it's like, that's the great thing about the arts. It's, it's about practicing and you fail and then you learn to recover. And that's what really helped get me through is because, you know, the arts is, is something that really helps you learn that patience to know that perfection is it going to happen and that mindset has to change. And so you keep practicing and then you realize you're going to fail. And then you have to figure out how do I recover and what's my strategy? What's my plan to keep going? Oh, that's, yeah, that's such a, a beautiful sentiment that I think we all need to be reminded of. So when you were ripping the book up and throwing it, or that was, that was a, that was when you, you know, I can't learn this song. I can't learn this song. Was that just your, your, your struggle with perfectionism that you hadn't learned it in the way that you wanted to learn it, that it wasn't coming fast enough or it wasn't, um, is, is, was that the, what you were going through at the time, the frustration of not being able to get it right? Yeah, I think, yeah, you know, it's like we, we live in this world where we, we compare ourselves to other people, you know, and that's the problem. So then sometimes we have to stop and then look at our own um, life. And so it's like being a runner, it's like running and singing, they started to work hand in hand for me. Because once I started to understand that if I can actually just run a better time, that's a celebration. And if I didn't win, that's all right. Similarly in music, it's like, okay, I learned this phrase, that's a celebration. Let's now move on to the next phrase where it might be easier for other folks. Like I said, I was a person that did not know, know how to play the piano. So it was hard for me to, to play my music. And so because I could not play my notes, it was such a struggle. So I had to spend more time um, twice as long um, and so part of what I had to do is figure out um, what could I do and how, how much time I need to put in to make it work and so I had to really put in a lot of time in, in um, ear training and also in learning how to play the piano in order to get that music better and so once I started to dedicate my, my energy there 
it, it, it got better. When you talk about loving to sing because you can feel it in your body, it sort of like it fills your body or it reverberates, you know, I, I wonder how much of a challenge in, I, certainly in acting as an instrument the same way, uh, not the same way, but a similar kind of situation when you're struggling with e emotion and how to balance and manage emotion to be able to have that be a proper receptacle for for what you're talking about you know you're singing and and being able to feel it were there along the way as a professional opera singer and when you were in school were there things that you did to sort of balance that emotion or to clear your instrument to be able to make it a, a resonant receptor if that makes sense well i, I would say what really helped is that i had some really great teachers um, both in undergrad and grad school and they were you need to have someone who has a nice um, easy mindset um, my undergrad teacher Ann Larson was so wonderful she was a uh, patient and caring um, and Dr. Soderblom was my piano teacher was also the same way and I think that really helped me make it through that struggle and then when I went to grad school I, I had um, Steve Smith and he was wonderful too and he was able to really get me to understand about the technique and he was very patient also and I think that's what really cleared the mind for me um, uh, of stop trying to create a sound for people, but actually learn how to communicate what it is they're trying to tell people. Mm -hmm. And so instead of, so once I learned to stop trying to put on a facade and, and stop trying to manufacture a sound that people would want, that actually then freed me to be me. And so I remember the thing that Steve would always say is there are lots of different types of cars, right? And so the, the, story, the, the example he always said to me was this. He said, if, um, if I told you, I'm going to give you a chance to have a car, I'm going to get you a car. It's either be Mercedes or a Toyota. What one would you want? And most people might say, okay, I'll take a Mercedes. And then they've said, okay, that Mercedes is rusted out, has no seats, there's, it has bullet holes in it, the tires are all mangled up, and it has no engine. Or I'm gonna get you this brand new 2021 Toyota Highlander with leather seats and everything. And what, which one do you want now? And it's like, oh, I want the Toyota. And so he always says, well, be the best car that you are. Be the best mm -hmm. car that you are. And sometimes you walk around and see some people saying, I'm a Mercedes, I'm a Mercedes, I'm a Mercedes. And they're a broken down Mercedes. And they have a great yeah. talent, but they never work. And then there's the people who actually, who are Hondas and Toyotas, and they work so hard and they sound so good. And they take care of the car and it's, it's wax, it's clean. And they're going, ooh, I want that car. And so once you start to figure that part out for yourself and stop trying to chase the other people's, or I say chase other people's ghosts, then you're going to be happy. And did you find it then easier to use your instrument as well? I mean, once sort of that headspace got, you know, got a little bit clear, did you find more access to your instrument? Um, yeah, I did. Yeah. You know, the thing I found is that um, a lot of opera singers, we just believe that we sing loud and we just scream. I mean, generally, right. That's how we think of opera singers. But then once you actually let go of that image and you start to look at the sounds, you start to look at the, um, what the composer is trying to say, you listen to the accompaniment, you're able to give so much different colors to what you're doing. And you're, you're free to really just take in the emotions of what's going on. Um, and then that's mm -hmm. when I learned I can actually sing a pianissimo on a, like a high G, which I was never able to do before. So actually I actually let it go. It's like, I was like, going, oh, it's fine. You can do that. <laughs> and, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like letting the let, letting the mind actually just kind of just communicate what is being said, and then communicate also with a little bit of your spirit in there too. And that was the thing that was so freeing for me. So, on your journey, at what point did you decide to to um, to leave, or not to leave professional opera, but to to work in in the arts uh, as, an, as, a, as an executive director? Oh, Lordy. 
Um, I mean, let me, I mean, is this another, is this, yeah, I do. I do. All right. Cause all I right. love, cause you, to hear you talk about opera and obviously all of that is in your work today and you bring all of that experience. And, but I'm always fascinated with when someone, what the, where you're at in your world, when you decide, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to move to this place now. And that's what I'm curious about. Yeah, so my journey from opera singer to arts administrator is one that I don't know if anyone else would ever want to do it. But um, as a professional opera singer, I was singing with many different companies. It was great, you know, going from different regional houses across the United States. Um, but that only takes you so far. Um, and, you know, the decision I had to make is like, do you want to go to Germany? That's a lot of young singers do. And, and for me, it was like, going, oh, I, just, I, love, I love the United States. Um, and so when I was in grad school, I worked at this uh, department store and I happened to be very good at spotting shoplifters. I don't know why, but I was able to spot shoplifters. <laughs> it's um, your sensitivity. It's, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it, You're it dialed might, in all over the place, right? I am it's now, a yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah. And I guess in the, in the part for me was that um, being a person of color, I actually started looking at shoplifters differently than people who were there. A lot of folks just looked at people who were like black and wore baggy pants or whatever. I'm like, and I didn't look at that. I looked at what people were doing. I looked at their eyes. I felt their presence. And then I looked at the actions and that helped me actually uh, break the mold um, to go beyond the color that the folks who were in loss prevention would do. And that's the problem a lot of department stores had was stereotyping people of color for yeah. stealing. Um, so I became really good. And because of having that different kind of eye, I um, was able to um, move fairly well in grad school to sing and do that as a, as a um, part-time job. So when I moved to the East Coast, I wanted to um, sing. I also wanted to find a job. So I ended up applying at Macy's. Um, and when I was there, I, I said, I may as well apply for loss prevention because that's what I did before. And, and uh, I got hired. My first day that, that I was there, I remember they said, oh, we'll get to you in a second. Why don't you go walk around the store for a little bit? So I walked around the store for about 30 minutes. I walked back into the office and I said, oh, there's someone over there stealing. And they were looking at me like, wait a minute, you're the new guy. What do you mean right. someone's stealing? I'm like, well, there's two women over there. They're uh, stealing. And they're like, ah, OK, uh, whatever, new guy. I'm like, OK. So I walked back out and I, I see this woman detective and I said, oh, those two women right there, they're stealing. You want to go watch them? And she's like, oh my God, they're stealing. <laughs> so she calls up and says, these people are stealing. They're like, what? It's like, yeah, the new guy said that it's like, and they are stealing. So they the end up stealing guy. the new guy. Um, so they wait, end up stealing. Wait, wait, but Mark, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but like, <laughs> do, do you, do you, okay, isn't this problematic that they weren't taking you seriously i mean all all facts aside that you're the new guy did, did that feel problematic to you or did you just think okay i'm the new guy there's no real reason that they should listen to me but i mean and that's i mean that mindset for me is like i would like even for my staff today i said there's no reason for you to trust me you don't know me so similarly here i'm here for 30 minutes there's no reason okay. for you to trust me all right i'm like sure. it, I, I didn't take it sure. as, um, anything but they ended up selling eighteen hundred dollars worth of merchandise. I was just gonna, but like, why not check it out? I mean, yeah, you know, eighteen hundred dollars. Yeah, eighteen hundred dollars. In what department? It was all women's clothes. They oh they God. pulled out some shopping bags and they stopped them in their shopping bags when they were in the fitting rooms, and it, it, that was what it was. And so that that um, impression on that first day made people go, "Oh my goodness, what is it that you know?" So I had all these people starting to come up to me and said, "Hey, can you help me? Can you teach me?" I'm like, okay. So I, I ended up teaching people who were there for a while um, what I would do. And then I started pulling and I said, let me show you how I do it. And I gave them um, my thoughts and people and they saw the numbers getting better. So then I became a um, trainer. So then about six months later, I said, we want you to become a trainer. I was like, great. So then I was really good. And I said, we want to hire, make you assistant manager. I'm like, okay, no problem. So then I ended up um, in my time at Macy's being moved from different stores. And part of what happened was um, I would get moved to stores to help change the culture. Because uh, like I said, in loss prevention, a lot of those of folks just stereotyping people of color to, to shoplift. And I always ask people, why are you watching them? And then I you know, asked those questions as, as I became a manager, as I became a um, director. Um, and so that really um, helped 
change just the culture. Um, and I, I was really good. And they still let me sing, which is the greatest thing in the world. They said, we love the fact you sing. Um, and then from there, I went to the container store. I became a regional manager for them. And then what I realized that I was doing all this and I had to make a choice whether or not I want to continue on this path or not. So I quit my job at the container store and I ended up teaching at an all black high school, St. James Prep in Newark. I started teaching at Monmouth University at Bergen Community College and at the Ridgewood Conservatory teaching private lessons. Um, so I did all that cobbling up the, um, those jobs to try to make the same amount of money I was making as a um, yeah. person at the container store. So I, I, so I think sometimes you know when you have to get back to your roots. And for me, I, I knew that I had to, to let go of that path and get to where I really wanted to, you know, be back in the music and back in the arts. Mm -hmm. But I would say that was the one, the great thing about it was that my experience working at Macy's and at the container store, I learned about business. So like you were asking me, like my path between becoming an opera singer to arts administrator, I had a hands-on experience and working for these companies, I've worked with merchandise managers, I've worked with other regional directors on sales, and I learned about EBITDA with these places. And so I'm like going, oh, this is how they put together budgets. Um, and so I didn't have an MBA, I don't have a master's degree in arts administration, but what I had was this practical experience of actually putting those things together. Um, and so understanding what it's like to be a performer, understanding what it's like to be an educator, and what's, what's it's like to be a regional manager and also in loss prevention. So I knew risk management, safety, all those things wrapped together. And I think that really helped me when I made that move into arts administration. I think it's such a, a great story to, for people who are right now, particularly, I'm seeing a lot of um, posts and people questioning that are that work in the arts as performers or work that, you know in, in various and sundry areas. And wanting, you know, wanting to hold on to that performance, but at the same time needing to shore up a, a different financial situation. And it's interesting and understandable how people they'll ask their friends, "Hey, could you guys feed back to me what I'm good at? Because I know I can perform, but what are these other things that I could do that would, would be valuable to someone in business?" And to hear your story about about your your sixth sense, you know, your ability to sort of very, very quickly suss a situation out or, or, or the things that you did to to keep on top of people that um, that that might have been suspicious in your days of loss prevention. These are all, you know, those are all skills and aptitudes that you had that I'm sure serve you well on stage, but also led into this whole other area of of being able to, you know, of business, of arts administration. And I think that's a, it's something for us all to keep in mind that we're multi-talented in that regard. It's just that sometimes we think, oh, I can perform, but what else can I do? I yeah, want to ask you, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say that, I think the, the, that's the thing that I, I um, you know, when I, when I work with folks and they, they ask me for like their, um, for some advice, I say, what's your superpower? And they're like, mm -hmm. what, what do you mean? I said, everyone has some sort of superpower that we just don't know. And sometimes you need other people to help you understand what it is. And if you do something well, go back in time and figure out why is it that I do it well and what helped, you know, helped me get there. And, and I know like in um, Malcolm Gladwell's book, he talk, in Outliers, he talked about you know, 10,000 hours of doing something really well. The fact that I interviewed people for a theft at the, the department store um, I had over 10,000 hours of interviewing people, I had over 10,000 hours of watching people, you know, and because I had over 10,000 hours of actually being on, on the stage and observing people and getting feedback, that helped me too. Um, and that's why, you know, what I'm saying, why is that true? you're good at talking with donors is because of that time of actually interviewing people for theft and understanding how to continue a conversation. Um, and so I think once you start to go back, you can start to see what are the things I'm doing so well over and over and over that's really helping me to become the person that I did not know I was going to be. How would you say in your, um, your, your current position as executive director, which we should point out, right? You, you became the executive director right smack 
is it not in the middle of the pandemic? What is 2020, right? Is when we're right in the middle of the pandemic, July 31st, my first day. Right. 2020. So what what was that like? Just first day on the job, here you are, you know, um, um, yeah, I, 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 this is not a clear question, but I, it, that had to be such an extraordinary um, first couple of months for you in a new job, in a new, did you know the area well? Did you know Lehigh well or Pennsylvania, Bethlehem well? Or were you moving from another location to be here? Yeah, I was moving from, from New Tom's Jersey. River, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I was I was moving from North Jersey. So I I, oh. I worked in Tom's River and I lived in North Jersey. Um, and I knew the, the area somewhat. Not I wouldn't say well, but somewhat. My um uh one of our older kids was going to college in the area. He was when he was doing lacrosse tournaments when he was in high school, we would come to Goodman um, Field to do um, a lot of tournaments there. We went to Jim Thorpe and did some whitewater rafting and we did a lot of trail bike riding in the area. So I, I knew a lot of that the outdoor stuff, you know, when it came to the area. Um, and what I would say is that um, moving in the middle of a pandemic for people that know me, they would say that makes sense for Mark Wilson um, because I would, having a, a growth mindset and not being afraid to take a chance was um, was important. I also came here understanding like the other part is that the grass isn't greener. You know, when, when you move jobs, you have to um, understand why are you moving? What is the uh, opportunity? What are the challenges? And for me, I just, it wasn't because me looking at the grass being greener at Lehigh, but the opportunity to work at a major university and help uh, bring it at a new level and also work with a wide variety of folks in this community. What I did know about the Lehigh Valley was it was an urban suburban rural area. And I just looked and said, wow, this is actually just a great um, makeup of the United States. It's a purple area. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the presidential elections from, from the past, it's like you have a, a mixture of different voices here. And I thought that's so important because for me, it's important to have community together and hear lots of different voices and to be able to tell a lot of different um, stories from those folks. Um, so coming here in, in that pandemic, to me, it made sense because it gave me a chance to really have things be at a pause where I, I realized at the time that people um, would be at the same level as me. Mm -hmm. So the staff that's been there for many years, that we were all now being the same plane. So therefore, um, me coming there, they had to look for me for help because they were not in a situation where they were at before. If I came in here in the middle of a, a season that was normal, they would have probably just mm -hmm. done the same thing and not want to change anything because they're like, this is what we've done. This is what we're going to do. We're going to keep on doing it. But because it was a pandemic, it was a pause. They're like, we don't know what to do. We need your help. Help guide us. Yeah. Well, as, as you're talking, Mark, I have this image of like a big department, a big Macy's department store, and you come in, you know, and the pandemic is, you know, happening and your attention to an eagle eye on, on things shifting and loss and, and sort of changes and the things that I'm guessing those spidey senses that you use to kind of suss out, I'm guessing as you're going through the pandemic, really came in handy, a, a because you're a risk taker, but also because it it seemed to me that everybody was reassessing everything at that moment with the information that we were being given, sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly, sometimes hourly. And to be able to synthesize a lot of that stim, you know, the the incoming information probably served you very well. And as you say, put everybody on a on kind of an equal plane. You know, I'm, I'm envisioning you all working in the department store and, Mar and, you know, and you're there and you really have this unique uh, aspect given what you've done in the past. Uh, you know, all the many, many different things you've seen and places you've been. What an interesting yeah, yeah. way to see it that you're all you're all equal, really. Yeah, I think, you know, being an actor on the stage, it's like sometimes you understand when you need to give up 
the stage when you have to, you know, when you go downstage, let's one upstage so that they can actually have the, the scene themselves. You turn your attention to them, give them the floor. Um, and for myself, I, you know, I, I let the staff understand at the very beginning. It's like, I don't have all the answers, but I'm going to learn. And I said, you don't have all the answers because things are changing. Um, and so that was, I think, the important part where it wasn't like I was coming here telling everyone with an iron fist, this is what we're going to do, follow me, I'm, I'm the hero. But it was more like, let's actually do this together. Um, and I explained to them that the important part for me was to really get us to work as a community, um, to really not think of a top-down approach, but really that how do I elevate you all to become leaders to help guide us together out of this itself. Um, I think one of the things we do is really think um, quickly. And then it's like also listening to each other also and making some quick decisions on what we wanted to do. So I think that's the part was, that was helpful for me is to um, be open and honest about the things where they were. Um, I explained to people, you know, the challenges where they, where they, where they lied. I try to explain to them what I forecast things to be as much as I could think about it understanding that what my main goals were was to really help um, sustain us and really um, keep us afloat and to make sure that I kept people understanding that right away as, as much as possible. Um, trying to keep the staff as much as I could intact, you know, as we saw a lot of uh, folks in the arts being furloughed and not having jobs for uh, many months. So part of what we were looking at doing is actually how do we triage things and keep things moving forward letting people know that if we have to make some tough decisions, we we're going to make some changes. It was great that we were able to think um, creatively. Two of my staff members moved and worked with the health and wellness center at the university. So that helped free up some of our salary lines so that we were able to then move them over there and then use that um, savings to help keep more of our staff here. So for them, the trust that I, I wanted to have a plan to keep the staff intact was, um, was, uh, was important. And I knew that was my, my main focus for them, but not promising this, but saying that that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could comment. I, I love um, this, uh, one of the quotes from um, one of the press releases that was sent out about, about your coming, coming to Zollner. If, in your quote is, if you are an engineer and you want to create something, and if you want to create something beautiful, you need to have an artistic eye to do that. And so if they come and enjoy the arts and are open, and, and we open up the creative brain, that would be helpful. This is in, in talking about your work at, at Lehigh, and I hope that I've quoted you quoted you correctly. Do, do, so I'm thinking of, you know, what we traditionally think of, let's just say engineering as being a, you know, a, a not creative activity, even though we know it's not. But I, do you think that for you is one of the goals to just get as many people to see the arts, to open up that creative brain? Is it, in, is it enough for you to have them experience it or is there more connection and immersion that needs to happen for you as you move through your time as executive director? Yeah, for me, what I learned um, from my time being in the arts and as an educator is if you want to really get folks to be deep, you have to go beyond just having them see something on the stage. And so for me, it's all about engagement. And I look at engagement as also a marketing tool all to, to really get folks to know more about what you do. And I also think it's important to not try to um, take credit for things, but like do what's right. Do what's right for the community, do what's right for, for people. And that's all that's important. You don't need to have the credit, but get the thing that's important done. But as, I, as um, to answer your question, an arts experience coming to see a show is wonderful. I think that really can open up some folks' minds, but then that is just a, a gateway, a place to start. But then I want folks to be able to have that chance to, to do the art, to make the art, because then that's when it gets into your bones, because that's what helps open up something. Because 
when you do something that you're not good at, like I said before, you practice, you fail, you recover, that helps stimulate your brain because then you know that you can continue to do something. You have the willpower to take a challenge. You want to continue on because you have practiced failing. You practice failing and you recovered. You feel good. Your brain knows that. Your brain says, ooh, I failed. I recovered. It didn't hurt. I can take a chance. And when we don't take those chances, then we hide away. We slink back and we don't go any further. And so that creative aspect of what the arts can do. So when you experience the art, you see someone is excellent, a world-class person, you're excited. But then when you make your own art, it's, you can see it's something that I did, something that connects to you. And then I look at how do we get the arts embedded into the learning process so that people can then use the arts to be very creative. So then we look at solving problems creatively so that if you're an engineer, you don't just look at the one answer, you look at multiple answers to solve a problem. That's the creative side of our brains. Um, because when you're, when you're learning how to sing, you say, you sing this um, phrase. And what I learned is that on Monday at 10 o'clock in the morning, that phrase sounds like this. At, on a Tuesday at eight o'clock at night, it feels like this. And on Saturday at midnight, I'm still up trying to practice that phrase. It feels totally different. So I cannot do it the same way. There's a different uh, way to solve that problem each time. And I think that's the part that's so important because when we just look at trying to find the one answer on that one day, we're in trouble. We, yeah. we say, we're done. I found the answer. It's like, nope, you found the answer for that day. Mm -hmm. But you got to right. keep that on moment creating. in that day. Yeah, there, I have a friend on the show a couple of weeks ago. She teaches uh, improvisation to neuro uh, to neuroscientists here in you know in Philadelphia, and it's a um, much of that work is just about you know breaking outside, taking the risk, failing, doing it badly, whatever that means to you, and just expanding the expanding expanding the internal and external conversation about that. In your planning for Zollner Art Center for the next couple of years, we talked a little bit before the show about the ways in which you can converge communities from around the world to influence and, and introduce art in all of its many forms to, to the community. Can you talk a, a little bit about, without giving too much away, um, some of what you're, you're thinking for programming and how you're hoping uh, the community will will respond? Are you? Uh, let, let me back up and ask you one question before that. Since this is a big a big aspect of of your initiative is to not only have people see the work on the stage, but then integrate it. How how do you find out what your community is thinking? Are you in just in conversation with them a lot, or how? What is your direct line into the community to find out? how this is all playing. Yeah, it's very difficult, you know, in the middle of a pandemic to, re to really um, get a chance to see some folks face to face. But part of what's important is to um, use the trusted resources of people who've been here in the community and to talk with folks. Um, my first year that I was here, it was mostly a, a, a listening tour, listening to um, some of the leaders. But then for me, it's not just the folks who have power uh, influence and wealth. I wanted to also get a chance to talk to those who did not have power, influence, and wealth and find out from them what can we do for you. Because when you talk about community, it's everyone. You want to bring equity into a system. So therefore you need to start to engage those who don't have the power to make those um, get their voices heard. And so going to um, some Zoom meetings with um, community organizers, hearing what's being said, talking with folks who are working with people who are um, economically disadvantaged people who are on the margins. That's what was important to me too, to see what we can do to really help bring them um, together. And I look at the arts as a way to really empower other folks and bring people who have um, different viewpoints, diverse voices together. In your thinking and planning for uh, well, do you, you have a season in 20, 2021, 22. Are you all doing live performances now? Or how is that? How are you reintroducing or getting back out either outside or inside in this coming season? 
So we did do a piece uh, this a couple of weeks ago outdoors, a dance piece called Dragon Cypher, combining um, some hip hop dance and a uh, modern Chinese dance together. And we do, we're going to bring in Acro Bufos to Baker Hall um, uh, on September 26th for a one o'clock relaxed performance and a four o'clock performance. Uh, and both of the performances are open to all ages. And we're excited because throughout the season that, that we do have, there are some artists that we have from previous years that we, we wanted to uh, make sure that we honored um, the commitments we, we made to them before and brought them to um, this season. And so we do have a lot of those things going on from this uh, fall and also in the spring. You know, and one thing I want to kind of go back and lean on, lean into is the fact that in, in the middle of that pandemic, it was very difficult. It was hard on both the agents and artists. And what we ended up doing was we had a digital season and we brought in six artists that we had um, chatted with before. And we wanted to really help them keep the ecosystem alive. And so some of those artists, we changed our live performance to a digital um, offerings so that we were able to continue to connect to um, our community. And what we wanted to do is we understood that if these artists and agents weren't having um, funds to keep them surviving for that time, they can go away because a lot of um, folks did not have the reserves to, to even make it past two or three months. Um, so we we wanted to not we want to be a part of the, the solution and not the problem. So we did um, continue to, to do that. And I told some of the agents that it'd be better for me not to actually pay you because I'm not going to be able to make up the revenue from ticket sales. But I'm going to do this because I, it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for our community to keep them engaged with with art. It's also the right thing to do for you all and for others. We brought them to our 21-22 uh, season. And so if you look at a lot of the artists you see during this time frame, they are uh, folks that we had scheduled from back even in the, um, the spring of 20. So some, some of them has taken a while for us to get them um, some of those um, shows back on, on, the, on its feet, but we are bringing them here for this, this season for live performances. And we are gonna keep people safe. Um, all the artists that we are bringing in for the fall are all vaccinated, our staff, and um, the students are all vaccinated too. People have to wear a mask to come to our, our events. And we are doing general mission so that we can keep people um, socially distanced uh, for those who want to feel safer in our environment. Was it a discovery for you or a, a, did you, how, let me not lead that question and ask the question this way. And that is during the pandemic, when you were doing your virtual, uh, your virtual offerings, were there aspects of that that you feel might, might last on for Zollner in some shape or form in the future? Might you offer a virtual offering of a show in case people can't get there in person? Or is, has, has that thinking, uh, is that thinking a part of your moving ahead, the ways in which virtual might work or how it might work for um, for offerings at the center? Yeah, it, it, I will bring in a little bit of my um, uh, retail experience, merchandising experience. I, when I talked to my staff, I said, so if we think of it as a product line, we are now creating a brand new product line while we're flying a plane. Um, and so we did- While you're flying a plane? Did yes, we were, we're basically we're yeah. building a plane while we're trying to fly at the same we're, time. But, right. Yes, okay. Yes. yes. So we're, we we're just put a new wing on this plane. <laughs> yes. Right. So, so building this um, digital season at the same time as we're at happening season, trying to tell people what we're doing was interesting. But yeah, some some aspects of it are, we're going to continue to to do it. But we're also going to get feedback from our community. Are these the things that you want? Because it's important for it to be a conversation between both what we want and also what the community wants. Um, obviously, um, you have to balance um, uh, the, the vision that you want to do and not just always think 100% of the community or 100% of your mind, but it's, it's a, it's a uh, yin and yang and it's a, um, pulling back and forth. But when it comes to some of these things, we know these are the things that we want to do. Our spotlight series, bringing faculty, staff, and students of Lehigh uh, on our stage, videotaping this, bringing it out to the community. We love that. It was a great way to highlight their talents, share them with the people across our community. 
give them the stage to share um, things that some folks were like a, an engineer and they wanted to actually do some some music that, that they wanted to share. And it was great to, for people to see this. We had the Dean perform. We had someone from um, the Health and Wellness Center perform. We had someone from the Office of um, Legal Counsel perform on our stage. And for people to see oh, them in a different- that's great. Yeah, so- So, so it was like a, like a light, cabaret night or where each person um, was in, showed their artistic Gems. Yeah, yeah. Each each. What we did was it, it was about a uh, three three to four minute uh, section that we did, and every week we would then um, highlight a video of one of the folks who we recorded on our stage. And so we thought that's really important um, to be able to do, and it's something that we are going to look to continue to grow, and we want to lean into, especially that itself, because for for us. Um, to either get even connect them with alums and people in the community, we think it's important to do because it really shares um, um, the artistic talent. And it's, like I said, it's also another way to engage um, the community and bring the community to Lehigh and Lehigh to the community. And, and as well, uh, and you, you pointed this out, but a way to engage the community within the community as well, the, art, the university community as well. Isn't it fun to find out that, you know, the, the the professor over that teaches quantum mechanics is also a tap dancer or you know I mean I, I always find that I, f I found that during the pandemic these surprising connections of people in our community it's one of the reasons we started this show was to we don't often get that chance to really sit and talk to people and get to know them in a, a little bit of a different way and I think it's you know it's also exciting for the employees and the students at the university to know there's great creative, you know, creativity um, going on within the, you know, within the, within the university itself. As you begin to, uh, as we begin to move back out onto the stages, um, what is, what is your greatest um, challenge, do you think, for this next, this next year, this upcoming year? Yes, I, we are still in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and the opportunity that we have now is that we have gone through a year through this um, muck and we know that we have survived. So now it's like, how do we go beyond surviving? Because I want to continue that growth mindset and, and keep the, the staff moving forward. So that to me is the opportunity and also the, one of the big challenges because we, there's the, the pull to, to want to get back to what's quote unquote normal. Um, for myself, because I came here in the middle of a pandemic, I don't know what normal is. So I have to be able to keep um, the community and also the staff understanding where we need to go and keep them motivated so when we are when we start to build back we're bringing people with us um the, the reality is we are going to have to probably rebuild our audience because mm -hmm. we haven't had them um some don't feel comfortable coming out still um possibly indoors so this year is a, the opportunity for them to watch what we're doing because they want to know are we going to do things safely are we gonna to continue to engage with them? Um, and so if we do those things and we put in the right pieces, so when we look at when, so when things get to a, pl a place when people feel more comfortable, they're gonna know that we are putting them first. Um, we've been thinking about the way we want to engage them and they're going to trust us. Um, they're gonna um, know that we've always been communicating effectively with them too. So that's the, that is gonna be the challenge is to make sure that we continue to connect with those because if we you know, lose an audience for two years, it's hard to get them back because when you do something that muscle, um, it, 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 mm -hmm. it, it does the same thing over and over and over. Yeah, I think that's the big question is did <clears throat> during this time, people found ways to stay connected, to stay entertained, to stay, um, to stay in touch with the arts however it was happening virtually and or you know through film or 
virtual museum tours or you know how whatever the aspect was what i think that's such an interesting question is what is that what is that going to look like and how quickly will people um, you know, feel comfortable coming back? And also what do they want to, what kinds of artistic experiences do they want to engage in? Um, just jumping, jumping, uh, jumping across the track uh, to, to, to our earlier conversation, are you still singing? Uh, well, not, not much. Um, I sing at home whenever I, I can. Was gonna say, <laughs> yeah, do you, do you think about that? I mean, might you, might you think about singing? Uh, yeah, I think you mentioned you're going to go, you're going to go back to your high school. Is it? Uh, yeah. So on October eighth, I will be inducted into the um, music hall of fame for my high school. This is the, be the first time that they um, have a music hall of fame. They've always had a sports hall of fame, um, and they were able to create this music hall of fame. And I will be um, the first class uh, along with my. Um, middle school music teacher. Wow, congratulations. Well, thank you. So do you have to work your voice? I mean, in order to, if you, if you were to say, you know, be singing in a month from now, how much preparation would you need to do to get your instrument in shape? Yeah, I mean, it will take, um, some time. I, I would need probably two hours a day um, for a week. And then at the end of that first week, my voice would be probably shot. And that's just to get myself like tuned up. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I, would, I would say it. And then I have re the recovery of the second week to, to sing and my voice would be a mess. And then week three, I would be back to somewhat of normal. And then I can start singing the music. And then week four, I can start to really start to get the stuff back into my bones. So it, it does take some time, but it's usually when I have to sing something longer than just a song or two, I, I need a lot of time. And then just the voice, it just takes a little bit of time to, to get back into shape. But the wonderful thing is because my teacher that I studied with in grad school, um, his technique was always about connecting your singing voice with your speaking voice. And, it, and so it's about actually not changing what you're doing when you're singing and speaking. He's like, if you can speak, then you can sing. And when you're singing, mm -hmm. you're speaking. And so it's, it's supposed to be like that easy. Um, and so it's like, <laughs> so, uh, so, so it, it all depends on how long of a time that I need to, um, you know, because I don't, I don't lecture um, students for, for you know, like an hour or, or hour and a half class anymore. So when I was doing that, I could probably, you know, go back and sing. Mm -hmm. But right now I don't, I don't, I don't talk as long um, to my staff. I'm not lecturing my staff for hours on end, so therefore <laughs> it takes you can time sing your staff meetings. You know, once you just sing it you know, next time and just yes, yes. you're killing two birds with one stone, just you know, staying connected. So how do you in your in your sort of you know working through your day-to-day -day world, you mentioned, you know, before when you would sing and that resonance you felt so connected and so alive. Are there things that that you do uh, or hobbies or things that you do during your life now that give you the sense of that same feeling? Well, I was, there's two things. So I do run, I run a lot. Um, so that helps keep me in. And, and my staff knows when, when I did a long run because I have lots of ideas and I say, okay, <laughs> I, solved, <laughs> I solved lots of things for my running. Um, and then the yeah, other thing- How far do you run? Um, it all depends, uh, anywhere between eight to 10 is, um, like the normal, uh, place. So, so I, I stay in this that, is eight that. to 10 miles we're talking about, right? Yeah. Eight to 10 miles. Yeah. Yeah. So, so is it, it oh, sorry. There we go. No, I was, yeah. So it's like hour to hour and a half of worth of running. So a day, every day, uh, no, no, I, I would do, um, some longer runs towards the weekend and I do some quicker uh, three to five mile runs to keep the uh, quicker tempo before I do those longer runs. So, yeah. And so at some point in that running experience for you, you reach this place that you hear people talk about, but is it similar to the place? Is it similar to a place you would experience when you were singing? Um, like I, had, I guess in your, 
in your being connected to your body, but also connected in that resonant way that you spoke about. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the great thing about running because when I run, it, does, it, it, opens, it opens up the body and actually helps my um, singing. That's the reason why I started running because it helped my singing. I was asthmatic. And so when I started to run, um, while I was singing with the Orlando Opera, um, the person who I was um, staying with as a resident artist, he was a runner. And so I started running and um, that really helped my stamina for singing. Um, actually learning how to, to get longer miles. I never, I was always a sprinter, but when I started to run long, it actually just helped my breathing. I was able to actually start to sustain longer lines. And I said, Ooh, so that's, that's the reason why I started to do a lot of this running. Um, wow. and so, Long and, and capacity, it, do you think? Yeah. 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 And, and, and just the fact of, um, getting the muscles to, to relax and open up when you're running. Um, and that helped me also when it came to singing. So it just came one, one in itself, especially when you have like a, um, a clogged nose, you go running and, and it just clears up. So it was like things I always did. And did that help your asthma as well? It did actually. That's the thing. I was so amazed. Like I was about to die. It was on Lake Ivanhoe. It was like, a, it was three miles around the whole lake. And so I ran like a mile and I would just die. And then I ended up walking two miles and then I finally kept building it. So I was able to get the three miles all around. And then my lungs just opened up where I was like surprised. Like it started to open up where my lung capacity is like, I was like, Ooh. Um, and so, and um, it helped really helped me with my breathing. Wow. Do you miss it? I guess you do. A lot of people say that, that, you know, they miss it on multiple levels when they don't, you know, when they don't run for a day or two, I guess your body gets used to it, your mind gets used to it and it, it needs, you know, if you're making all those discoveries too and you're coming back to your staff meetings and you're all, <laughs> and, you get, and you've got multiple ideas, you know, I think go for the run, get the multiple ideas and then sing the staff meeting. That might be the way yeah. to do it, you know? <laughs> well, well the, answer, the answer to your other question, I mean, the other part of that question is that, um, because I have my degree in music education, um, as an educator, I think to me, it's, it's, I think that's why you say, do you miss singing? It's like, I don't as much because um, I guess truly I'm, I guess I'm more of a, I am a music educator. So I have, I still have the education because working with my staff, to me, it's great to mentor folks and to help as much as I can. Um, to see something as, as I told you before, as a loss prevention, to be able to see something and be able to see something in, in a person or be able to see a process and help someone through to be able to get people to reflect back and think deeper about what they're saying was important for me. Um, and so I, that's the thing I, I, I guess I have, um, I love is that I'm still able to mentor and educate um, folks to, to bring them along their journey. Well, Mark, uh, thank you so much for sharing so many great stories. I love the journey and so many lessons that we can all take in our artistic uh, trajectory. And it's just been a pleasure, Mark. Fitzgerald Wilson, the executive director at the Zollner Arts Center. And I do wish you the very best in the coming years. It's, uh, we put over in the chat in there, the, uh, the link to Zollner Arts Center at the Lehigh University. I hope you'll all check it out. And thank you for taking the time to be here, Mark, and, and to share a little bit about your life, some great food for thought. Well, thank you so much for having me. Best of luck. And thanks to you all for being here. We hope that you'll join us during week number three of the French Festival next Saturday when Michael Toner will be back. Actor, director, we're going to talk about Beckett some more. We have a couple of plays that we specifically are going to focus in on that Michael has performed on or that we have on the docket that we're interested in looking into. So it'll be a conversation about Samuel Beckett, all things Irish. And I hope that you'll join us on next Saturday's show. So from everyone here at the IRC, thanks for being here. Have a great week ahead. Be well.